What's up, family? Glad you're here. You glad you're here? Hey, listen. I don't know if you've noticed this or are you, if you're recognizing this, but something's shifting in the atmosphere. Listen, God is moving. A few weeks ago, we had a healing service, and it lasted till like two in the morning. And there were over 200 and some people healed. This morning at the Mount Pleasant campus, there were a couple of healings, and I think in each service of the student service of the student area. Jahira, who is one of our youth leaders, her back was healed. Conlon, who's one of our students, had a massive headache, and all of a sudden there was a keyboard player who didn't hit the wrong note, didn't hit a note, and then a note like hit, and the moment the note hit, his headache went away. The God who moved in the word of God still moves today, still heals today, still restores today, still gives peace today and direction today. And so, listen, I want you to, I want you to open your hearts tonight. Open your hearts, open your mind, open your eyes. And if you are a skeptic, my prayer is that you will doubt your skepticism. That God will show himself so real in a moment, in a word, in whatever, that he'll show himself to you. The questions you're asking, that he'll answer those questions in the name of Jesus right now. If you're a believer, my prayer is that you will go deeper into your relationship with him. And I just wanna say welcome home, students. This is where we need to be together. This is family. And I do wanna say this before I, before I start into a, into a scripture. Do we have that? Sweet, we have that on the screen, it's awesome. I'll explain that in a second. I wanna say this. Middle schoolers, actually high schoolers, the middle schoolers need you. They need your example, they need your maturity, they need your, um, your, your depth. They need the influence you have. They need you. Don't let anyone think less of them because they're younger than you. Be an example to them. They need your example. Middle schoolers, we need you. We need your energy when we feel tired. We need your excitement levels when we, when we don't have those. And I do believe there's maturity in you as well. Rise to it. Rise to it. Step up in it. So I'm assuming by the attendance here tonight that you are the ones whose parents said, you can go. <laughs> I sent a letter out to all parents. I sent a text out to all parents saying that we're going to talk about sex. <laughs> we're going to talk about relationships all right so get all the awkward like movement out now just get it out like because here's the thing this is something the world has gotten wrong but this is something that the world is far more louder in than the church and we have to flip the script. We have to change that. It shouldn't be uncomfortable to talk about what God created. It shouldn't have to be uncomfortable to talk about what God created. And listen, there's only one context. <laughs> there isn't the world's context, it's God's context. And so we're gonna dive into that a little bit. But I wanna read a scripture and I want you to see this, um, this, this picture on the back. And basically what this picture is, it's a kind of a cartoon looking heart. Look at that. And then a black and white picture of, of a potter's hands. And this picture is going to be on the screen all night. And if you need to, if you, if you feel like I can't keep my attention, look up at the picture and ask God to share something to your heart in this. And this is, this is, this is what the scripture says. It's found in Isaiah. And it says this, Lord, you are our father. And it's pretty... Um, Kind of daring to say that in a, in a somewhat fatherless generation. There are some people I can assume in this place that don't have a great relationship with their father in this room. The, the father may be present, but 
absent in everything else, or the Father may be completely absent in your life. So whenever I say Father, a lot of times the, the barrier for anyone is the fact that you have an absent Father in your life or a bad Father relationship that you can't, you can't think that God the Father could be that good of a Father to you. And my goal and my, my desire for you is, is to not filter your earthly relationship with your heavenly relationship. Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. Your hands made all of us. Your hands made all of us. Lord, you're our Father. Lord, you're my Father. We are the clay. I am the clay. You are the potter. Your hands made all of us. And the only one who can truly satisfy your heart is the one who made it. So I have a, uh, I think we've named him Charlie, right? Is it Charlie? Charlie. I have Charlie here. You see Charlie? Can you see him? He's a goldfish. He is alive. He's alive. He's, he's bubbling some things. Um, so what do you think what do you think this statement, what do you think this statement means, ready? If you wanna know what water is, don't ask a fish. If you wanna know what water is, don't ask a fish. Here's the answer. Fish don't know they're in water. They have no clue that they're wet. They have no clue that where the environment they're in, the culture they're in, they don't know what water is. This is all they know. This is all they know how to survive. If I were to pull this fish out of the water and have him just lay on this, this table, desperately gasping for something, right? He'd be gasping for water. <laughs> if you put me in water and dunk me down, I'd be gasping for air. They don't know what water is, so if you, wanna, if you wanna know what water is, don't ask a fish. This thought points to the difficulty in understanding our culture, right here. So I'm gonna explain culture. This is how the night's gonna go, you ready? I'm gonna talk to you about culture. I'm gonna talk to you about God's created order, and then I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna put the father hat on, and I just wanna be a spiritual dad in a moment. And then we're gonna pray for each other, and we're gonna ask God to continue to do in this place what he started a couple weeks ago, but has, what has been birthed over five years of us as leaders praying for you that a move of God would move through this student ministry. And we're gonna see God bring healing. We're gonna see God bring restoration. It doesn't have to be difficult, students. All, it has, all that has to happen is in the name of Jesus, go. In the name of Jesus, come. In the name of Jesus, because in, the ne in that name, knees have to bow. Mountains have to move. So something that culture has gotten completely wrong, we're gonna start defining culture. So what is culture? Here we go, the Latin word is cultura. Everyone say cultura. cultura. All right, I'm gonna give you a little bit of teaching, and we're gonna have a little bit of fun, and we're gonna have some prayer, it's gonna be good, ready? Which means agriculture, plowing, tilling, sowing, cultivating. So culture refers to what people do with the world. What people do with the world. It's what people do as people. You catching, you with me? People create culture. So if what people do with the world, people create culture and in turn, that culture shapes people. That makes sense? You with me? Because listen, all of us live in a culture right now. Not cultural. Right, there's a lot of cultural differences here where we have different cultural backgrounds, but all of us live in a subculture of this, of this world. So basically you can say it's the world in which we live and the world that lives in us, but the problem isn't that humans create culture, the problem is the type of culture we create. See, in, in Genesis, um, God gave us uh, uh, um, he gave us something to do with the world, right? He gave us a responsibility for the world. It was be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, right? So he gave us a job, a responsibility for the world. And so if culture is what people do with the world they're in, are they doing the thing that God has asked them to do with 
that culture, with that world. So being shaped by culture means we take on its image. We take on the image of culture. We absorb the world's ideas. Everyone say idea. An idea is spread culture through its champion. Say champion. So we take on the world's ideas, and the ideas are spread through its champions. Do you know what the champions are, the culture's champions? Artists, musicians, movie stars, right? 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 It's what people do with people. Right? Champions spread ideas. And what's, what's really sad is that we have elevated Hollywood, we have elevated YouTube stars, we have elevated Instagram models, we have elevated these social media people to be our cultural champions and our cultural spokespeople. Now listen, we're gonna get to, we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you context here. Because you have to understand, you're living in culture and you don't recognize it. You don't recognize you're in water because this is the water you live in. And so the champion, the ideas we have that, that this is supposed to be this way or you're supposed to look this way or you're supposed to have this status or this and fill in the blanks of what we have, right? The FOMO blanks, fill them in. But the champions will say what's important for culture, will say what you need to do. And so really, if government wants to change anything, they really need to look to Hollywood because Hollywood has the biggest voice. Even so much so, back a few years ago, there was this, this fire festival that was supposed to happen, right? That was supposed to happen. And basically how they, how they spread the word out was through social media models. And that's how they got this word out. There was no massive marketing scheme. It was through their cultural champions who spread these ideas. And so we live in this culture, but we rarely think about it. And we rarely think about the effects it has on us. Unintentionally, we become culture-shaped. Everyone say culture-shaped. Rather than being an example and intentional about shaping culture. So I want you to grab this, this statement. I think it's gonna be on the, on the screens. Culture tends to shape us most deeply by what it presents as normal. Now, somebody should have went. No, not now. Culture tends to shape us most deeply, stop, by what it presents as normal. Did you grasp that? Did you truly grasp that? It shapes us most deeply by what it says is normal. So we're living in a world where culture is saying a lot of things that are contradictory to scripture is normal, right? Yes? No? Culture tends to shape us and influence us, deceive us by what it presents as normal. We settle into its routines, we settle into its lifestyles, its habits, and we consume its products and ideas and the assumptions about the world. So the big question I have, and this is what I really want you to wrestle with, and I'm praying that God will grab a hold of somebody tonight, truly grab a hold of somebody tonight, is culture shaping your understanding of faith, or is your faith shaping your understanding of culture? Is culture shaping your understanding of faith, or is your faith shaping your understanding of culture? Is your faith the filter of how you navigate culture, or is culture the filter of how you navigate God? Because if it's the first one, if culture is shaping, you're going to navigate, navigate God all wrong, all wrong. A list of do's, don'ts, this and that. And listen, God's nose, they're meant to protect you. His nose aren't meant to harm you. For I have a plan for you, says the Lord, plan to prosper you, not to harm you. Plan to, plan to give you hope and a future. So culture is leaving a generation confused mistaken and misguided. But Christ says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, this culture, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So you're going to be transformed in the image of what you stare at the most, and you are going to stare at something. 
You will be transformed into the image of what you stare at the most. And all of us are gonna stare at something. And my heart's deepest desire is that you would stare at Jesus. You would stare into his word. You would stare at him with all that's within you. And you would gaze, you would fix your lock on him. And yes, you may trip and you may mess up and you may whatever, but your focus is on him. And we would become quick repenters and quick to run to the altar and quick to be in his presence and quick to be in his word. We well stare at something, so who or what is shaping us? Who or what you behold shapes what you believe and changes how you behave. All right, here we go. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created everything. Everything. How do you say everything? I mean, let me see, let me see how I say it in sign. How do I say everything? Everything. Everything. Do it. Do it with me. Do it with me. Come on. Everything. Right? God created everything. And in the beginning, God shaped you. He breathed his life. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. It's his breath in our lungs. So here's the thing. If God created man, woman, he created the living beings, the creatures, did you know that we were the only ones he touched? We were the only ones he formed. We were the only ones he breathed life into. We were the only ones he spoke into existence. We were the only ones that he had his hands upon us and he formed us. He formed us. So if he touched us and he breathed his life into us and he created us into his image, then we should be able to speak life into each other and life into dead things and see healings happen and see him move across this place because he, you are his image bearer. You bear his image. You bear who he is. So you should have that same power that raised him from the grave lives in you, and you should be able to speak those same things into existence. But we have a generation that is speaking negativity and speaking death over their own life. And you well become what you portray and what you speak over yourself. I'm too stupid. Has anybody ever said that? All right, thank you. You're with me. Or I'm not, I'm, it's, it's better. Maybe you, know, you don't say I'm too stupid. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Death. Or you don't have to show your hands on this one because it's, it's gonna get more personal. I'm, I'm too ugly. You don't have to show your hands, but thanks for those who did. Death. Begin to speak the very life that he spoke into you, that created you. Begin to speak that over you. Do not let culture define you because culture has no place in that. No place in that. So, Genesis 1, God is the creator, he's the designer, he's the author, and he owns the copyright. The one who designs it, defines it. All right, say it with, with a little bit of attitude. Say, the one who designs it, defines it. Let me see some sass. Uh, right? Uh, you better tweak that later or uh, Insta, Insta snap it. You know, right? Designs it, defines it. So listen, the one who designed relationships defines relationships. So if I said God was the creator, the designer, the author, and the, the owner of the copyright, if he designed relationships, he defined relationships. If he designed identity, he defines identity. If he defines, if he designed sexuality, he defines sexuality. If he, de if he designed marriage, he defines marriage. Culture has no place in the deceiving you and making you think everything that this world values is normal. Genesis 1.27 says, God, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In his own image, image bearers, to bear the image of God. God made us, he shaped us in his own image. Our identity is found in the image of God. And we can truly, we can only truly know ourselves if we know God. If we do not know God, we don't know ourselves. And it's hard to 
define ourselves when we don't know the creator. <laughs> and so we begin to speak the wrong things over our life because we don't know the creator, the designer of our life. We can only truly know ourselves if we truly know the creator. We truly know the author. We truly know the designer. We can only then truly know ourselves. And, and this is also true for culture. Culture can, will truly know itself when they understand and they know the designer, the creator, the author. And if we don't know God and his word, we will default to the loudest noise. And culture is pretty stinking loud, isn't it? Stinking loud, man. It may not even have to be an audible noise. It is a visual noise. And in a generation that is visual, I just thought I'd... All right, stop. So shortly after that verse, we move into uh, discovering God's intention for men and women. Genesis 2, 24 says, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Say one flesh. There's a specific um, blessing and it's called the one flesh union. That is God's design for sex. And I said in the email and the text, we're gonna talk about sex and I'm not gonna get weird because I have my own kids here. And that's just weird. But you do, you do need to understand God's design and God's created order. There is a created order for, for everything and God has an intention and a plan for you and a design for you and this one flesh union is, is God's true, it's God's good, it's God's beautiful plan for us. And, then, and here's the thing, there is no guilt and there is no shame when it is, when it is under God's blessing. A few years ago, I talked to you about the hoopah. Remember the hoopah? Spelled chuppah. And basically in Jewish tradition, when they got married, and, and even some today, they got married, they got married under this uh, tent. And basically what that represented was God's blessing residing over the couple. Anything outside of this hoopah was unblessed. And so when they made their vows and their covenant, which we don't really talk about covenant these days, and when they made their covenant to God before, in front of each other, in front of witnesses, and in front of God, they made it under the blessing of God. And anything outside of that blessing is not, is not blessed. There's a design, there's an order, there's a, there's a created order that God has for humanity and for his people. And so Mark 10 says this as well. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, the one flesh union. Sex is not a dirty word. It's, um, I think it's something we need to talk about more in the church because this is a generation that feels like sex is expected. And so there's a weight you carry. There's a, a tension you carry. There's a, I feel like I, I may lose love if I don't give all of who I am. And I want you to know, listen, don't feel that. And some of us in this room, we may have already ventured into those areas, but I do want you to know there is second chance. There is second purity because things that are done outside of Christ are covered by the blood of Christ. They're covered by the blood of Christ. If you're in this place and you're like, John, I, I, I may have made a mistake or I may have, listen, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I, I skipped ahead, but that's a verse I'm gonna share with you. There are second chances for you to, to chase Jesus and for you to get your life in, in the place where God's blessing is more abundant for your life. And so it's not a dirty word. It, was, it wasn't an accident. God created it. He wasn't sitting up in heaven and, and saw Adam and Eve down in the Garden of Eden going, whoa, 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 time out. 
Time out, what are you doing? No, 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 no. It was, he, he created this. It was a gift. It's a gift from God, and, and Satan, through culture and sin, distorted it and has used channels of influence to distract, confuse, and deceive us. Some channels of influence are BET, MTV, NBC, ABC, BBD, the East Coast Family. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's used channels to distort his perfect, beautiful gift. But we are immersed in this culture. You still with us, Charlie? We are immersed in this culture, and we don't understand. We think some of these things are normal. Moving on. It's a gift intended for man and woman in the context of marriage. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much God's wedding gift, his wedding present. You know how a lot of us bring wedding presents to a, a wedding, like a card with money? God's like, hey, best gift ever. There you go. It's God's gift. Sex is good, and it must be protected because of how valuable it is. In this generation, because you feel it is expected, because we don't talk about it enough, and we don't give you the freedom to ask the questions and, and you feeling like there's guilt and shame attached to it. No, there shouldn't be any guilt and shame when you have a question and you're wrestling your salvation. You need to find that safety net. And you need to find the, the people who have those biblical backing, those biblical values, because honestly, I'll get to that in a second, but God's story doesn't start with thou shalt not but with God saw that it was good. He saw that everything he created was good. He didn't start in Genesis saying, thou shalt not. The thou shalt nots happened because we took the world he gave us and we began to create our own cultures. Then those things started happening. And so really, we, created in, we were created in God's image, but somewhere along the way, we settled for a cheap imitation of something else or someone else. In Romans, it says this, they traded the truth of God for a lie. So they worship and serve the things God created instead of the creator himself. We've traded the truth of God's word for lies of culture. And God has a divine order. He has a created order. And Adam first met his maker. Then God gave him a mission. And only after he met his maker and then had his mission, then he had his mate. Right? And so God's created order, everything has a place. If Fire is so beautiful, right? Isn't it beautiful? Gorgeous in its right context. Outside of its context, it is destruction. A fish belongs in water, belongs in an aquarium, not a blender. Is he even alive? Are you with us, Charlie? He's not even alive. No, he's swimming a little bit. Here's the deal. Some of you cared more about that fish than you did your own purity. There is no blade in that blender. I already learned that lesson. But that's... Huh? Huh? A fish doesn't belong in a blender because it would bring destruction. Just like things outside of God's blessing, outside of God's designed and created order will cause pain, will cause hurt, could cause death, could cause disease, could co you, you can fill in the blanks. God has his designed order, his created order. Make sense? Does that illustration pretty much hit home? So how do you walk wisely in a foolish world? How does a mistaken and misguided generation navigate culture? Here's the tensions you face. Ready? The world we live in, the weight we live with, and the word we live by. The world we live in is broken. It is broken. Can you agree to that? Broken. The weight we live with, which is the tension between the word and and culture, but the weight we live with is what is truth? 
what is what is right, but my heart says this, my heart says this, but scripture says, don't follow your heart because it leads to destruction. It says, guard your heart because your life flows from it. And so we've got this weight that we live with that, well, culture says this is right, but the word says this is wrong. And we, but, but here, here's the thing, the third one is the word we live by, living by God's standards. Where the Bible stands, we stand. So I wanna give us some fatherly advice and we're gonna go into worship. Sound good? I'm gonna put my father hat on. I'm gonna place my children's faces all over you guys because really I feel like I have a mandate as a spiritual dad to all of you. And so I wanna share some advice to you and write it down. Please, hope this, this, this lands in your heart. Share some advice with you. Now that we've talked about culture and how culture wants to deceive you and think that everything is normal, but God has a created way, a created order for, for sex, for sexuality, for your life. Here's some advice. In my 22 years of working with students, I've had more conversations that revolve around pain, guilt, and shame and hurt made over poor decisions. And God honors good decisions. Blessing truly does follow obedience. So this talk isn't just about what you need to stay away from, but it's, it's really um, what you need to live for. What's your vision for your life? What's your vision for your life? So here's the point. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Inside of that, here's some thoughts, ready? The most important relationship in your life should be the one between you and God. We are love-shaped people. A proper love of God shapes all other loves, shapes all other things. So if there is a true relationship between you and Jesus and that, that love that is just digging in to God, a proper love, will shape other loves for you, will we'll, we'll shape your relationship, dating relationship, will shape that, and, and hopefully that proper love of God will in turn be a proper love of the opposite sex that you are dating. And then the love for your spouse. Galatians says this, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So will you love, obey, will you trust God even when you want something else for yourself? Guys, a woman's heart needs to be so buried in Christ that you have to seek God to find it. It's not an original, I wish it was. <laughs> Girls, a guy's heart should be so buried in Christ that you have to seek Christ to find it. Ladies, if a guy doesn't love God more than you, he will lead you in the wrong direction. Same same way, guys, if the girl doesn't love God more than you, it's gonna lead you in the wrong direction. There's a big difference in someone who knows God versus interested in knowing God. These are father advices, okay? So whatever sticks, write it down, pin it to your life. Until Jesus is enough for you, no person or thing ever will be. I like this one. Run after Christ, and if someone keeps up, introduce yourself. You run that with me? All right, let's go. All right. You need a third wheel in your life. You need a third wheel in your relationships. You need a third wheel in your friendships. No one wants a third wheel, but you need the third wheel. Why? Because accountability. And we need accountability because sin just makes us dumb. It makes us dumb. And the scary reality is you can find answers anywhere you want to justify what you want. You can look up Google and Google is not the gospel, right? And you can look up Google and you can find the answer you want to find to justify your behavior and your actions. But then you get so ticked when someone, your small group leader or your pastor says something that is truth because you know what? Truth stinking hurts. You get so mad and then you say, I'm mad at the church. No, 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 no. You need to understand that that love of that person for you that they would say the truth to you, is that they are trying to help you avoid the scars they may have encountered, or that they see the roadblocks that are coming ahead. If you're confronted with truth or avoid people because you know what they are going to say, that's an indication that you could be drifting further from God. Dating often isolates you from others, and Satan would love nothing but isolation for you. Right? Have you ever, like, like, girls more so, I think, than guys, but a lot of girls are like, we're not friends anymore. Why? Well, I've got a, just got a boyfriend. And they get so mad, right? Girls, you get so mad because, like, they just ditched you. You with me on that one? Right? Yeah. Hello. 
So, learning that dance. All right. Um, if you are always having to defend him or her to the people who know you and love you, that's a sign. Here we go. Flee temptation. Don't flirt with it. We have a generation that flirts with temptation and does not flee it. You were never designed to fight temptation. You were never designed to flirt with temptation. You were designed, you were begged by scripture to flee it. You cannot fight it. You can't resist what you're supposed to flee. And the more you find yourself in a situation where you need to say no, the closer you get to saying yes. And even if you're not looking for sin, I guarantee you sin is looking for you. So, if you're in an environment that has inappropriateness, you need to learn the bounce method. Bounce your eyes. Everyone bounce with me, ready? Bounce. Bounce. Like, and anymore, where we live in this day and age, you're pretty much, you're, if, if you really practice the bounce method, you're gonna see students walking all over, all over your town doing this. <laughs> I, I just wanna walk straight, I just can't. That's what culture is, we're immersed in this culture, right? We're immersed in this culture. Change your environment. So for the next 30 seconds, guys, are you ready? The next 30 seconds, I don't want you to think about anything, I don't want you to think about anything green, okay? I don't want you to think about money. I don't want you to think about grass. I don't want you to think about anything green. Oh, yeah. All right, don't think about green. Nothing green. No leaves, no grass, no money, nothing. No leprechauns, nothing green. Was that difficult to not think about green? All right, I'm not gonna show that picture, Trish or Taylor, I'm not gonna show that picture. Um, don't buy the cultural lies. Don't buy the cultural lies. First John says this, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. They are not from the Father, but are from this world. Cultural lies undermine God's truth. Here's a lie, what you do when you're going, uh, what you do when you are young won't impact your future. That's a lie. What you do when you're young won't impact your future. That is a lie. Dating someone who doesn't love Jesus won't affect me. That is a lie. Anything but sex is okay. That is a lie. You were made to bond. That is truth. And here's the thing. Even, um, I had a parent ask me if I would talk about this, and I will. Even inappropriate pictures, which we, we call pornography, bonds you. There's a bonding agent that happens. And did you, did you know that most uh, pornography sites and most of these issues has to do with sex trafficking? That these are, these are young women and young kids and boys that are ripped from their home? Not all, but there's a lot that are, that are abducted and forced into this lifestyle and people are finding pleasure over it? Does that not make you like vomit sick? It, like, it makes me like, like vomit sick, like righteously angry. And I had a moment as a dad where I saw a man try to take my daughter a couple years ago. Sorry, I don't, I'm, can I share that? You cool with that? Because it makes me sick. I'm sorry. It makes me sick. I'm trying to pick up my daughter from school. She was alone in this park where she walked to. And I'm driving. I'm late. I'm texting her saying, hey, we're, I got to pick up the other kids. I'll be right there. I'm pulling up. And I see a guy 
in his car, and he's waving at her to come to the, to the car. And I'm like, and I'm in my minivan. I'm like, what? I'm in, like, you know what I'm saying? Like minivan rage. And I'm like, I pull up, and I pull, and she can attest to this. I pull right in front of his car, and I, get, I go to get out of my car. What's up? I'm about ready to kill you. I'm about ready to take your life. And you know what? God will forgive me. Matter of fact, I think God will give me permission because you have no reason to even be talking to my daughter. I was so like boiled, boiled and sick. And I called, I called one of our police officers who are on staff here and, and she said, that's the fourth time that car was reported. That's what this industry wants, but a lot of us, we stumble on it or we want to look at it and we bond to it. That is sin. And students, I know that in this room, guys and girls struggle with it, but allow God to fill that void. Allow God to give you the peace. Allow God to give you the direction. Allow God to give you hope. Allow God to fill the gap and fill the holes. We don't need to be stare. What you stare at, you become like. So may we stare at Jesus. May we stare at Jesus. May we be a generation that stares at him. The choices you make, truth, the choices you make with your body now bond you with the other person. It bonds you. It's a bonding agent. Truth, what you put into a relationship equals how much it will hurt when it's over. One more. Done. We're going we're gonna to worship. Guard your heart. You win before you begin. Set boundaries. So be it issues. Set so be it issues. As for me, this is sin if I do this. Set boundaries. You win before you begin. Don't be ashamed that your standards are stronger than the other person's. Don't be ashamed that your standards are stronger than your friends. Don't be ashamed that you have high standards. When you feel pressured to go past your boundaries, that's called manipulation. <laughs> be careful who you give your heart away to. Just because you have chemistry doesn't mean you have destiny. Don't follow your heart unless your heart follows Jesus. Most of the pain in relationships can be traced back to a result of impatience and selfishness. Don't be enamored with a boy whose coolness peaks in high school. Don't be enamored with a boy who's cool in high school because it peaks in high school. They ain't cool after high school, so whatever. Don't be enamored with that. May he be chasing Jesus and you just try to keep catching up. Because you know what? God's designed order is that the man would lead. So we need young men to stand up, take their place, and lead. 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 If not, sit down and let the other guy stand up because we need someone to be an example. We need examples in this place. We need examples in this generation. We need examples. We need examples in this move of God. And a big move of God's gonna happen when purity becomes a priority. And you're gonna see God, like his hand, like begin to just sweep over this place because your priorities are being set, being placed in order. And when we've got students taking their place and leading and standing and leading, watch out. Watch out. Instead of waiting for um, Mr. and Mrs. Wright, we settle for Mr. or Mrs. Wright now. Don't settle. Marry someone who has a different favorite cereal than you so that way they don't eat all of yours. Just saying that. Who you are before you date someone is who you are when you date someone. Singleness is not a struggle. Singleness is not a struggle. In the wilderness of loneliness, set up camp with Jesus. Set up camp with Jesus that he would direct your steps and he will bring in his timing. And listen, 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 listen. This isn't the right time. This isn't the right time. This is your preparation time. 
This is the time that you were able to get things in order so that you can have the full life that God has intended for you, has set up for you. Final point, there is forgiveness and you have a future. Shut your eyes with me real quick. There's not gonna be a raise your hand, come forward moment, but we are gonna have a moment around the altar and it's not gonna be, please do not rush this stage. If you're gonna come to this stage, which I call an altar, I don't call it a stage, I call this place an altar. If you're gonna come up front, this is a place for you and God to just do business. Wherever you may be at, it may be saying, Lord, I wanna begin a relationship with you. It may be, Lord, I just want to set apart my life for you. Or Lord, I may want to second chances. No one's gonna know why you're here. Only Jesus knows. But there needs to be a generation who is willing to lead the way. And willing to say, God, whatever you have for me, I'm gonna chase it. I'm gonna embrace it. I'm gonna go after and there is forgiveness and you have a future. Even if sex is part of your past, it doesn't have to determine your future. Romans said, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So to be truly countercultural means being truly like Christ. I'm gonna pray this scripture over you, I'm gonna pray, and we're gonna worship, and I want this altar to be an altar. Altars in the Old Testament were places where they had, they had sacrifices, and they brought a sacrifice to the Lord, that the aroma would be pleasing to, 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 to God, and this is a place where I want it to be an altar that you may have to crawl to, you may have to crawl upon, you may have to kneel at, you may have to find a, a space, but it's between you and Jesus saying, God, here is my life. My sacrifice to you is my life, my new decisions, my new life, whatever it may be. This is the prayer. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. So Jesus, in the powerful name, your powerful name, I pray for this generation. I pray for my family, spiritual sons and daughters that I, I deeply, deeply care about. I pray that this word will, would not have fallen on on hearts that wouldn't wanna pay attention, but God, that it would have fallen on a generation that is ready to see you move and is willing to pay the purity price, is willing to pay the, the popularity price, is willing to pay some, some prices so that they can be closer to you. And so right now in this place, if your eyes are shut, your heads are bowed, and you're, you're just, it's just you and Jesus, I just want you to to ask that, that big question I asked that is, is culture shaping your faith, your view of faith, or is your faith shaping your view of culture? And there's gotta be an honest answer to that. If culture is shaping your view of faith and you've been living just mediocre, now is the time to change that. Now is the time to take that step and step into what God has for you the joy, the blessings, the no more shame. And listen, in this place right now, in the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus, if there is a past in your life, we don't have to carry that weight of shame anymore because he broke those chains. He broke it right now in the name of Jesus. You don't have to live with that guilt. You don't have to live with that bondage. You don't have to carry it anymore because there are people who wanna carry it with you and leave it at the feet of Jesus. But we love you, Jesus, and we thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. May this be a place tonight as we sing the final songs.
If you need to, if you need to feel like you gotta rush this place, stay in your seat. But if you feel like you need to have a, 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 a spot with Jesus, would you be bold enough to take it tonight? Find it. Find the healing you may be looking for, the alone time you may be looking for, the salvation you are looking for, the change you need. Find it and let us see what God will do as a generation humbles himself and says, God, may my faith define culture, not culture define my faith. Let's do it. If you need a spot, I would say come. I wouldn't wait. I would find it and get before the Lord because he's gonna do something and he's gonna move and he's gonna heal and he's gonna touch and he's going to change your life.